Imagine a world where the ocean feels like a hot tub. The water has become so acidic that sea creatures struggle to grow their shells correctly. Heat permeates down into the ocean depths, leading to waters that can't hold enough oxygen for animals to breathe. With so much heat, the sea is also no longer content to stay in place. Melting ice has led to rising sea levels, consuming whole cities along coastlines. Water pours into sewage systems and fills the ocean with years of accumulated excrement, feeding dangerous red tides of toxic algae. And that is just the beginning of the horrors on land. Within the cities, people suffer. Urban heat sinks exacerbate high temperature days and each new heat wave kills thousands. Electrical overload from air conditioning use causes blackouts. People regularly drown during the summer, seeking a way to avoid the omnipresent, suffocating heat our bodies are not adapted to handle. Tremendous heat stress sporadically overpowers the expansion joints in older bridges, causing structural problems that make them too dangerous to cross. Over time, high temperatures in urban environments also penetrate underground systems, damaging foundations and turning groundwater into putrid breeding grounds for microbes. Even at higher elevations, the slightly cooler weather still pummels buildings and roads, with changed precipitation patterns and increased storm severity. Road washes and landslides become more common as the landscape adjusts. Summer fires become autumn fires, which become year-round, filling our skies with smoke, which causes permanent lung damage in broad swathes of the population. Though these fires are not perpetual, they are the final death blow to our current biomes. With temperature and precipitation changes, our forests find themselves quickly outpaced and lose ground to more fire-resistant environments. Even small temperature changes can have big consequences. But what would those consequences mean to life on Earth? Could we survive in a world where our very infrastructure began to crumble around us? This extreme scenario may seem impossibly far off, but the truth is that our planet has already experienced a climate like this. 56 million years ago, the world's temperatures quickly shot up, reaching a potential average of around 15 degrees Celsius higher than today, leading to incredible changes in our planet's oceans, biomes, and landscapes. And in the 50 million years since this time, the Earth's temperature has continued to change, but in the opposite direction. The Earth has plunged from hothouse to cool house to an ice house cold not seen for over 250 million years, once again leading to remarkable adaptations across the globe. And one of those adaptations may have been us. It is January 1987. A strange ship drifts to a stop in Antarctica's Weddell Sea. Painted in deep blue and bright white, what visibly sets the Joides resolution apart from the other ships is the 62 meter tall scaffolding structure that towers above it. It is not a sail, instead, it's a crane for an even greater structure beneath the boat a drill pipe capable of reaching over 8,000 meters into the ocean below. Though the Joides Resolution began as an oil drilling ship, it is now on a mission of scientific exploration. But not of the surrounding waters, but what lies deep in the sediment below. On board, a group of 25 scientists wait in anticipation as the drill begins to lower, first through almost 3,000 meters of water, and then drilling through the seabed. Over the next 27 hours, the drill pipe pulls up 213 meters of compacted Earth's history. One particular section catches the scientist's eye, an oddly red layer of clay 
a vivid contrast to the normal brown-grey-green ocean sediment that surrounds it. Though only 20 centimetres thick, this unassuming tube of mud would soon prove the existence of an incredible climate event. For 56 million years ago, the continent of Antarctica was a balmy 15 degrees Celsius along the coastline. A far cry from the sub-zero temperatures the region sees today. Fossils from places like Antarctica's Seymour Island provide more context for this alienly lush world, preserving ferns, conifers and flowering plants. For a time, Antarctica's coastline bloomed with temperate rainforests, and animal fossils show it was home to strangely discordant fauna, like giant penguins and small, tree-dwelling sloths. But how did researchers pull these temperature estimates from a simple tube of mud? How did they find out that the climate changed at all? Especially so deep in the past. Some of our earliest evidence for cultural understanding of climate change comes from fossils, especially fossil plants. Perhaps the earliest is from the year 1080, from a Chinese scientist named Shen Kuo. The author of many monographs, he was also a passionate geologist who wrote about sedimentary rocks and landscape changes long before the Western Age of Science. Shen was inspecting a landslide near a riverbank when he found a forest of bamboo shoots exposed in the bank collapse, all of which he saw had turned to stone. Fossil trees and other plants were known at the time in China, but what surprised Shen was that this bamboo forest was preserved in an area that was too dry for bamboo to grow. As a result, he surmised that at some point in ancient times the area must have had a much different climate. Damp and cloudy, similar to the areas where bamboo grows today. In general, when you find an animal or plant preserved in a place that it does not and cannot possibly live today, that is a very clear indication of a climate change. Fossils of all kinds can tell us important information about past climate, but many go beyond simply telling you about the general ecosystem. Many plants and animals have highly specific temperature and precipitation requirements that can give very precise estimates. One particularly well-preserved example is found in the oil shales of Messel, Germany. Today, the region grows a temperate forest biome, and while the winters are quite cold and the summers quite hot, the overall average is above freezing. But thin layers of mud from an ancient lake show the region was quite different 47 million years ago. Primates, ancient horses, and turtles are only some of the remarkable fossils found here and the deposit also preserves two more precise indicators of climate, palm leaves and crocodiles. Today, though palm trees conjure up a vision of tropical paradises, a few species are a little more cold tolerant. Even so, the most cold tolerant palm trees typically live in areas where the average annual temperature is at least 10 degrees Celsius, and winter days are mild without much freezing. This provides a lower limit for Messel. It couldn't have had many frozen days in the winter. Even more specific are crocodiles. As ectothermic animals, they derive their heat from the sun, and on cold days, they struggle to move and digest. Their eggs also require heat to develop, requiring a warm summer or spring season to hatch. As a result, modern crocodilians cannot establish a population in any place where the average temperature is less than 14 degrees Celsius, pushing that heat limit even higher than palms. And not all useful ancient thermometers are large fossils. Small things like pollen and algae also have specific growth requirements. Finding them requires patience in a microscope, but their presence and absence can help tell climate as well. But knowing that Messel must have been more than 14 degrees on average doesn't tell us why that was the case, or why it changed. And just as we haven't always understood that the climate could change, we haven't always understood how or why it changes either. It wasn't until 1824 that a French mathematician named Joseph Fourier published his theory that the atmosphere itself could retain heat. That discovery relied on the understanding of a special type of energy, known as dark heat, something today we would call infrared radiation. 
Though emitted by our sun and any warm object, the wavelength of infrared radiation is so long we cannot actually see the light itself. These light waves also move more slowly through the atmosphere, which is why our planet retains heat from the sun instead of losing it back to space. This means that our atmosphere itself acted something similar to a greenhouse, trapping this dark heat and keeping the planet warm. But Fourier wasn't certain what gases in our atmosphere were slowing down the dark heat. That discovery would come a few decades later from an American scientist named Eunice Foote. In a simple but elegantly designed experiment, Eunice carefully filled glass tubes with different gases – carbon dioxide, water vapour, nitrogen, and others. She sealed thermometers inside and placed the tubes in the sunlight. As the light and corresponding dark heat hit the glass, she observed the gases beginning to heat up. And soon she saw that carbon dioxide not only warmed the most, it also took the longest to cool down. She was the first of many to study the impacts of carbon dioxide on our planetary warmth. Her results were later confirmed by an Irish physicist in similar experiments, and the path forward for climate science was truly set. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, is a hugely influential heat-retaining gas in our atmosphere, so much so that we can use it as a thermometer for past climates. More CO2 means that time period was warmer, less means it wasn't. Scientists have reconstructed past atmospheres up to 800,000 years old, using preserved bubbles of air in ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica. But Greenland and Antarctica haven't always had ice. To look deeper, we need a proxy, something that shows us CO2 concentrations even if it doesn't preserve the carbon dioxide itself. Leaves exchange gas using little holes on the bottom surface. When there is a lot of carbon dioxide, plants breathe easily, and so their leaves have fewer holes. When carbon dioxide is lower, leaves have to play catch-up. As a result, just looking at the holes in well-preserved leaf fossils can tell us what past CO2 was like. But the most common way of measuring CO2 is to look at the carbon itself, which can be found fossilised in the plant's cells. Plants prefer to breathe carbon-12, the most common form of carbon in our atmosphere. But in times of low atmospheric carbon, they will be less picky and begin to take up more carbon-13, the heavier, clunkier isotope. And so, it is possible to reconstruct how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere when these amounts in plant fossils are measured. Using these and other proxy methods, scientists have been able to put together a fairly good record of atmospheric carbon dioxide for the last 500 million years and thus a fairly good picture of the Earth's climate. And the story told by this data is one of many different climates throughout time. The world has bounced between hothouse climates of high carbon and icehouse climates with much lower amounts. Five hundred million years ago, the world's oceans were balmy and warm providing a gentle womb for an explosion of multicellular life. But over time, new life and changing geology slowly drew down the carbon in the air until a sudden, unexpected drop in the Ordovician sent the world into a glacial ice house and a mass extinction event. Though this did recover as the glaciers cut off the carbon sequestration processes that had caused them in the first place, causing carbon to once again become common in the atmosphere, it was only for a short time. 350 million years ago, plant life itself sent a spinning from a warm climate into the depths of another ice age. Early land plants began to expand, leading eventually to massive swampy forests. These plants pulled CO2 out of the air, but when they died, bacteria failed to fully break them down. Instead, much of the carbon remained locked up in logs and plant material which would eventually be compressed into coal. This drawdown triggered another glacial period at the beginning of the Permian, which only ended when volcanic eruptions through those same coal deposits pumped the atmosphere back full of CO2. And so, around 200 million years ago, 
the climate began heating up at a slower, less dramatic rate, with smaller swings of a degree or two, instead of ten or more. This trend continued through the age of the dinosaurs, a gradual increase with smaller deviations. By the time the Cenozoic began 65 million years ago, the Earth was still much, much warmer than it is today, which led to tropical animals and plants in places you might not expect. Seventy-five million years ago, parts of our planet are truly alien. Here, in what will one day be called the Prince Creek Formation, the low twilight barely reaches through the canopy of pine needles and ginkgo trees. Unperturbed by the shadows, a large herbivore moves through the brush, looking for a nesting site. It bears a large frill like other ceratopsian dinosaurs, topped with two strange antler-like horns. The snow is retreating, and the daylight grows a little longer and a little brighter every day, as the northern pole tilts back towards the warmth of the sun. The long winter days of darkness are ending, and the Alaskan spring is right around the corner. Dinosaurs like Pachyrhinosaurus must lay their eggs soon, so that they can capture enough heat to hatch. But this frilled dinosaur is not lost or stranded in this nighttime world. Remarkably, she and others like her were permanent residents here, north of the Arctic Circle. Though the winters were not nearly as harsh in the Cretaceous, the Arctic Circle is still the Arctic Circle, and scientists today still do not quite know how these herbivores survived periods of complete darkness. We simply know that they did, for we find the bones of hatchlings and adults alike in fossiliferous localities from Alaska to Siberia. Carnivores, on the other hand, have an easier explanation. Most of the polar theropod dinosaurs were smaller, and one in particular seemed to thrive. Troodon, a small carnivorous dinosaur known primarily from North America. There are more Troodon fossils found in Alaska than there are in other places lower in the United States, suggesting this theropod wasn't merely enduring the polar north, but thriving in a way it couldn't elsewhere. This may owe in part to its enormous eyes, which would have given it excellent night vision, something that undoubtedly came in handy during the many days of darkness. But the cold was less of a concern. In the Cretaceous, the Arctic Circle was far warmer, with a mean annual temperature of around 10 degrees Celsius. This was of course still far from the tropical climate most picture for dinosaurs, and still cold enough that no amphibians or cold-blooded reptiles like turtles or snakes have yet been found. Instead, the environment is best described as temperate, somewhat mild and cool. Though the presence of a temperate environment in what is now tundra is surprising, it's not nearly as strange as the Arctic got only twenty or so million years later, when it got even warmer. During the early Eocene, some 55 million years ago, temperatures continued to slowly climb, and as they did, the world's ecosystems adapted and shifted. Tropical and subtropical rainforest expanded north, away from a now too hot equator, and into zones that remained habitable. A grand global rainforest stretched across the North Pole, flourishing in a carbon dioxide rich warmth. Ponds and riverways were home to hippo-like pantodonts like Corypodon, who worked to evade lurking alligators. Massive, five-centimetre-long ants marched through these woodlands, traversing across land bridges where Europe and North America touched. Mild winter temperatures and hot summer temperatures evaporated enormous clouds of rain, fueling the growth of subtropical rainforest and mangroves along the coast. This was a true hothouse Earth, with the poles reaching somewhere between a mean of 16 and 21 degrees Celsius comparable to places like Zambia and southern China. But such hothouses were not entirely jungle paradises. While plant life could flourish in the Arctic, it was a migration, not an endless expansion. The equator itself was nearly unlivable, with averages of 40 to 50 degrees. It's also of course important to remember these are averages, not minimums or, importantly, maximums. 
summers would have been even hotter than the already hellish equatorial average of the time. One of the earliest known true primates is Tyardina, a small, tarsia-like primate whose fossils help link together the true expanse of the hothouse Arctic rainforests. It is found in Asia, Europe, and North America, all nearly simultaneously. Though small, this primate spread quickly across the North Pole, pushed forward and onward by a vast expanse of livable, subtropical rainforest. Tyardina shows up in the fossil record during a time of especially extreme warmth, known as the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, around 55.5 million years ago. An already warm Earth experienced even greater heat, sending the ocean temperatures skyrocketing. Indeed, this strange event is what the Joides Resolution found entombed in that reddish layer in the mud. Analysis of isotopic carbon shows us that temperatures rose by 5 to 8 degrees above an already warm baseline, climbing and peaking before returning to normal in about 200,000 years, a geological blink of an eye. The cause was an incredibly large release of carbon into the air over almost 20,000 years. This event dramatically changed the world's climate, but only for a time. Our planet is always in flux, geologically and biologically, and the trend of gentle warming that started nearly 200 million years ago was soon to change. As our busy world began to reabsorb the excess, evolution drove further changes as our planet eventually transitioned into a cool house environment. And one particularly important change was the evolution of a plant we now take for granted. Grass. Grass is deceptively simple. Its leafy blades contain microscopic pellets of silica that wear down the teeth of those foolish enough to eat them. It can regrow quickly from near its roots, letting it recover rapidly from grazing and fires alike. It is also wind dispersed, so it doesn't rely on animals to transport its pollen. The first grasses show up in our fossil record during the Cretaceous, but truly began to shine in the age of mammals. After all, Trampling may kill trees and bushes, but it doesn't destroy grass. And in the cool weather, grasses seized a chokehold on the world's biomes. They spread quickly and began to form the first grasslands, open ecosystems that changed how animals lived as well. Grazing animals like horses evolved longer teeth to deal with chewing through the silica-laden leaves. In open environments, herbivores struggled to hide from predators and so they evolved as well. Some, like horses, grew longer and stronger legs to sprint away from their prey. Others hid in large herds, leading to packs of carnivores in response. If it's hard to imagine a world without grass and sprinting animals, it's because grasslands rewrote the rules of survival. And in Africa, the homeland of our history, Grass and a cooler climate continue to change everything. Today, Africa is separated into vast regions of different biomes. The center of the continent is home to a dense rainforest. Spreading outwards from these jungle heartlands are the vast savannas and grasslands, with the great deserts to the north. But the strong regionality of Africa's biomes has not always been so clear. While always a warm continent, the environments of today's Africa are largely dictated by precipitation. Indeed today, the different monsoon systems of Africa dictate where and how much rain will fall. But rainfall has not always been so predictably even. 30 million years ago, Africa was a patchwork quilt of different environments. Diverse types of forest and grasslands grew in many different places, each dictated by local climate instead of a continual one. Our ancestors would therefore have had easy access to many different environments to exploit, instead of vast sections of ecological sameness. This was the world of primates like Egyptopithecus. A small, tree-dwelling primate, Egyptopithecus made its living in the mangroves and inland forests of what we now know as Egypt. Though drier than the polar rainforests of the Eocene, Africa's climates were still varied and many wet. But not for long. Since the Eocene, the rainfall and subsequent climate of Africa have been changing. Strangely, this has been caused not by carbon dioxide, 
but by changes in other continents, specifically in Eurasia. Around 50 million years ago, the continent of India collided with Asia and broke Africa's reign. These two tectonic plates had been warring for quite some time. When plates of our planet collide, a colossal game of rock-paper-scissors is played. Heavy, dense plates lose out to lighter continental plates and sink below the other to eventually melt and create volcanoes. The Indian plate was initially a combination of dense oceanic crust and light continental crust. When Asia and India had initially collided 80 million years ago, the Indian plate had gracefully lost the match and descended. But when the chunk of India's continental crust approached that boundary, the relationship changed. Suddenly, each plate bore similarly light crust, difficult to bend or break and making a winner hard to decide. But the churning dynamics of Earth's mantle continued to push them together even when neither plate was dense enough to descend beneath the other. This matched strength and stubbornness continues to this day and has caused a mountain range to form. We call this range the Himalayas and it is a testament to the two plates' eternal struggle for dominance. But the uplift of the Himalayan mountains was not without its consequences. Without volcanoes at that boundary, less carbon dioxide was pumped into the atmosphere, and the Himalayas themselves stand tall and block and rearrange atmospheric patterns. This created the Asian Monsoon, a circulation current that now dictates the amount and timing of precipitation for an incredibly vast region of the planet. Gone were the days of patchwork biomes in Africa, and over time, Africa's rainforests retreated to the region where the seasonal monsoons still supplied enough rain to support them. Grasslands expanded to exploit the absence of trees, forming vast savannas. Our primate ancestors had to decide whether to follow these forests, or, as many of them did, adapt to live outside of them. Imagine a day so hot it melts candle wax without flame, sends tar boiling up from the asphalt and bends and melts railroad lines. These were the conditions of a heat wave in the North Atlantic coastline of North America in 1911. Blistering temperatures struck coastal cities in July and lingered for 11 days, setting temperature records as the population suffered. Nearly 5,000 people were sleeping on the streets at night, trying to escape buildings that turned into ovens in the absence of air conditioning. Overall, estimates are that 2,000 people died during that 11-day streak, many driven mad by the heat. Our world is not always easy to live in, and while humans have now expanded into all the regions of our planet, we're still not always able to deal with certain temperatures. It may sound extreme, but it's becoming more and more common as our climate continues to change. Scientists estimate that for each additional summer day above 32 degrees, seven people per one million die, while hundreds more fall ill. And this number may be a conservative estimate in areas where these temperatures are unexpected. Yet still, 32 degrees doesn't seem so intolerably hot, especially compared to the sweltering days our planet suffered during the Eocene. Our planet now exists in a mild and moderated ice house climate. For the last two and a half million years, our planet has fluctuated up and down a few degrees within a much colder spectrum, somewhere between four degrees warmer and eight degrees colder than today. At the bottom end of the spectrum were the glacial maximums, periods marked by the expansion of glaciers out of the mountains and down into the valleys and flatlands for millennia at a time. The last of these was 25,000 years ago. These icy expanses reflected back light and heat, and our ancestors struggled across icy wastes. And so, has our cool house climate made us vulnerable to heat? Would humans even have been able to survive in a climate like the Eocene? We do have many adaptations for extreme heat, even without air conditioning. 
All of these are effective, but they are impaired in children and the elderly, and often in individuals taking certain medication. Of these, perhaps the simplest is behavioral thermoregulation, a fancy term for when we move to a place to cool off. This may be as simple as finding shade or air conditioning or diving into water to help us in the short term. In the longer term, some people find themselves moving permanently away from climates with difficult heat. We also have a number of physiological adaptations to deal with heat. Our skin has less hair, we have more sweat glands, and they're spread across our body, unlike those of other animals who have more localized glands. Like dogs, who have sweat glands in their paw pads, but not across the rest of their body. Being bipedal is another benefit. Standing upright means we are exposing less of our skin to direct solar radiation from above, and also means more of our body is exposed to wind from the sides. Yet even with these adaptations, our bodies still have limits. Even more so as we move and exercise, when our bodies produce heat. Our internal systems cannot tolerate much more than 40 degrees. For most, once the temperatures get truly hot, we use behavioral thermoregulation to control our thermostat. But studies have been done on what happens to our bodies if we can't do this, if we're not able to find areas that cool off, we start to shut down. Our muscles begin to cramp, especially in our legs and stomach. We sweat, pale and cool, until dehydration overwhelms the effectiveness of our cooling system. With less water in our system, our blood becomes harder to pump. Our blood pressure rises and our heart races. Our skin begins to redden. We become delirious and confused, often becoming incredibly dizzy or fainting. And then, we die. Considering that the planet during the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum had averages of 40 to 50 degrees in some areas, it stands to reason there were places where humans would have been completely unable to live. But of course, as we know, temperatures would cool. And so how did the changing climate influence the rise of humanity? One problem humans face with high temperatures is that we are warm-blooded and we cannot turn our internal heating system off. Remarkably, not all of our primate relatives are so afflicted. Animals like mouse lemurs are capable of turning their internal heating down, or even off. This means that over the course of a day, a mouse lemur's internal body temperatures can range between 18 and 37 degrees. Meanwhile, in humans, we are considered hypothermic if our body falls below only 35 degrees. This ability to turn off the heating in their body is known as torpor, and many small primates seem to be able to do it. They can lower their resting metabolic rates, using only the heat from their environment to keep them warm instead of wasting energy to do it themselves. In a hothouse world, it's an incredibly useful adaptation. But of course, our world was not a hothouse forever. As the world cooled, habitats in the cradle of humanity began to change. They became more open and separated, and so our ancestors needed to be able to travel over much greater distances with much greater efficiency. This may have influenced the arrival of the signature adaptation of early hominins, an upright, bipedal posture. Walking on two legs is significantly faster and takes less energy than the type of quadrupedal motion our ancestors initially had. For example, while chimpanzees can travel around 2.9 kilometers an hour, typical humans can travel at around 4.5. Being more mobile meant we were able to take advantage of a much larger variety of habitats than our quadrupedal relatives, walking between them and using resources as we found them. Most non-human primate species are arboreal, maintaining ancestral specializations to live in woodland and forested environments. Even fewer have managed to survive outside of tropical environments, with very few primates living at higher latitudes or higher elevations. While lower metabolic rates and torpor may be useful in hot ecosystems, they're much less useful for adapting to the cold. The high metabolic rates of humans made us able to adapt to many different environments, and our efficient bipedal gait helped us to get to them. Ancient hominin species are found in many different habitats. 
For example, Ardipithecus has been found in both forest environments and wooded grasslands. And as hominin brains grew and the climate continued to cool, our ancestors spread across Africa and Eurasia into innumerable habitats. The tropical grasslands and woods of Java, the brushy lakes of China, and higher elevation terrain in Europe, where carnivores were less likely to stalk. Today, we live across the entire planet, from sea level to thousands of meters above it, in snow and sand and monsoonal rain. Our bodies were adapted for versatility and variation in habitat, preparing us to adapt to many different ecosystems as the climate continued to cool. And once we were bipedal, many of the other behavioral adaptations of humanity became a lot easier. Our hands were free for tools and to carry our children. With tools, we became more efficient foragers, which in turn provided nutrition to support larger brains. In this way, cooling climates and diverging ecosystems seem to have driven primate evolution away from small, heat-resilient primates trapped in trees to the tall, big-headed and widespread creatures humans are today. So we should be grateful for our cool house climate for as long as we still retain it. And so it's clear that the changing environment affected our development. But the question remains, why exactly did our climate cool from its Eocene high? Fifty-six million years ago, our ancestors would have had quite a view. Sitting in its favorite tree, perhaps an ancient Tyardina gazed out into the distance and admired the bloom. A thick carpet of green coated the water, made up of millions of tiny mosquito ferns. These plants were so abundant that we find their remains today, filling up sediment cores of the Arctic Ocean. And for periods of time during the early Eocene, these aquatic ferns were so common that they must have blanketed almost the entire Arctic Ocean. And even more strangely, this plant, known as Azola, is only able to grow in fresh water. The Arctic Ocean was lush, warm, and fresh water, all caused by carbon dioxide. Today, our atmosphere has far less. Instead, our planet's carbon is stored in other areas. Indeed, there are many things that can store carbon. Swamps full of logs prevented from rotting may have absorbed it during the Carboniferous. Coral reefs lock it away into colony structures, and a lot of it is stored by rocks, specifically of the Himalayan mountains. Carbon can combine with rock through a process known as weathering, and this carbon-laden sediment runs down through rivers to its eventual resting place in our oceans. This means that more exposed rock, especially if that rock is rich in silica, can store more carbon. And the Himalayas have exposed an incredibly large relief of rock in the last 50 million years, sending our atmospheric carbon down into the sediment off the coast of India. It's also done so near the equator, increasing precipitation and weathering that might not have happened if these mountains had formed closer to the poles. But most scientists think that the Himalayas did not change our entire atmosphere alone. Instead, they probably had help from other carbon storage systems, including oceanic water itself. During the Eocene, we see many strange changes in our ocean ways. One of the strangest is the change to freshwater in the Arctic. Moving from salty ocean to salt-free lake means the Arctic Ocean must have largely been cut off and isolated. Today, the Arctic Ocean circulates with the rest of the planet through places like the Bering Strait between Alaska and Russia and the Greenland Sea between Greenland and Norway. Yet during the height of the Eocene, most of these gaps were missing. Instead, there were ridges and higher ocean floors which may have helped to close off the Arctic and allow the freshwater Azola to flourish and grow. But cutting off the Arctic Ocean does not simply create a strange freshwater sea, it completely changes the water in other parts of the planet as well. 
The Arctic is the source for some of our coldest water. This means it plays an important role in ocean circulation. Cold Arctic water sinks while warm equatorial waters rise, creating currents that keep ocean temperatures stable and ensure that the bottommost ocean waters remain quite cold. Cold waters also dissolve more gases, storing vast quantities of CO2 in chilly waters at ocean depths. But without the inflow of the Arctic Ocean, the planet's oceans heated more evenly and stored less gas, helping to lead to the high CO2 atmosphere we see during the Eocene. However, this system is self-regulating. The land that locked the Arctic away was only so tall, and with more meltwater and precipitation in the Arctic, and some tectonic changes as well, eventually the Arctic Ocean overwhelmed its banks. It eroded down the bathtub ring of rocks into the seas and straits we see today, resuming its role in temperature regulation and CO2 storage. And we know approximately when this happened because of this tiny but abundant mosquito fern. Azola dominates Arctic sediment cores from 49 million years ago to 48.3 million years ago when it suddenly disappears. This signals the return of salt to the Arctic Ocean and the transition to our current global climate. And this fern has even more mysteries to solve, and perhaps a greater role in our current carbon crisis than we may realise. While all plants consume CO2, some consume more than others, and Azola is a greedy breather. In fact, given the amount that was in the Arctic, some scientists estimate that just by itself, Azola could have removed between 50 and 470 parts per million of carbon dioxide during its reign. For context, in the present day there is about 418 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in total. This incredible carbon storage capacity is why some scientists are looking at Azola farming to help rein in our current carbon crisis. And yet, the Arctic Azola's timeline does not quite seem to match up with our planetary change. And so it's not completely clear whether Azola's contribution to CO2 drawdown was in the end real and important, or merely an untapped potential. In the end, weighing the contributing factors of ancient climate changes can be a tricky business. Carbon from volcanic activity may have been instrumental in creating the hothouse maximum, but later eruptions could actually have helped cool our planet. As well as creating acid rain, sulfur dioxide can counteract some of the heating elements of CO2 in our atmosphere. And so considering climate on these grand scales demonstrates how changeable our planet can be, and reminds us of the fragility of life. With every rise and fall of global temperature, our planet transforms into a new, unique iteration. Vast polar extremes melt and reform, rainforests migrate up and down the globe, jungle becomes desert. Everything is interconnected. Flora and fauna, the atmosphere above, the seas around and the tectonic rumblings below. A change in just one area can cause countless species to disappear in another, whilst others take their place and thrive in this new world. And we are no exception. Without the Earth's transformation from hot house to cool house to ice house, our story would not have even begun. You've been watching the entire history of humankind. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave us a comment to tell us what you think. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.